Please do not, because I like my job, and I like being able to make sure we can all do things. So we've already I can't... had an incident with alcohol on the site before. Yes, we have. Yeah. Drinks on the veranda. Yeah. Ask me about that one. Sir. <laughs> so this is a. I, I do a historic uh, drinking program where I combine humor and history, which leads us to a historic beverage, uh, uh, a program that I call um, Drinking Through History on YouTube. I have literally tens of ones of followers, so if you want to check that out, that's, that's fine. Number 11. Shameless. So this is... Uh, this one, if you've watched any of them, might seem a little bit familiar. I fortunately am able to adapt it specifically for what's going on here this weekend. Hi. He's the key grip. He's the designated driver. I, un I unfortunately don't have any of my quippy little video clips that pop up, so if I use strange voices, just go with me on it. So, thanks for coming and checking this out, and I hope that you all learn some stuff and have some fun and enjoy a historic beverage all together. How are Confederate spies? In 1864, President Theodore Roosevelt the fur trading post of the Upper Missouri Outfit in 1827, and a fellow by the name of Sherwood Shed Sterling connected. Booze. Booze, yeah, rum. The answer, they all enjoyed smoked buffalo tongue. I actually can't back that up at all. I have no idea if that's true or not. But I do know a lot of other cool stuff, and we're going to talk out about that tonight, find out more. Well, together we enjoy drinking through history. Did you say smoked buffalo tongue? Yes, yeah, smoked buffalo tongue. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. I saw There's no. Oh, There's, no. okay. There's something that must happen now, though. Good yeah. evening, fellow history tipplers. I'm your host, Leif Alverson, and welcome to tonight's live episode of Drinking Through History. If you've got a beverage you wish to enjoy during your history lesson, screw it, because we're going to drink history instead tonight. No, if you want to sip on something, go ahead and do that. Um, to begin to answer a question which will eventually lead us to tonight's beverage, we obviously are going to have to look back to the past. Cut scene to the Golden Girls. Picture it. Sicily. 1912, as Sophia would say. Well, it's, it's actually going to be New York. It's not going to be Sicily. And while 1912 doesn't play a specific role in tonight's lesson, 1913 does much further on as we go. And we'll get to that eventually. But we've got to start by going back to the year 1836. In New York City in 1836, a man builds a hotel. Not too impressive yet. Now, the owner had a former home in this particular location. And over time, he ends up purchasing all of these lots around uh, the, uh, the home that he's got. And on those lots, they ended up encompassing an entire city block and he builds this hotel um, on this entire city block. And it's not just any hotel at that time, it ends up being the best hotel that's in New York City. It was originally opened and called the Park Hotel. Not exactly sure, possibly because it was actually across from the New York City Hall Park, though history remembers it more by a different name instead. Park Hotel was it was pretty uptown for its time, both figuratively and, and quite literally. It was constructed of a bluish Quincy granite by a Bostonian architect named Isaiah Rogers in kind of a Greek revival style. I have no pictures to show you. Just go along with me and pretend like you know what I'm talking about. In the front were these two large columns by the front entrance. It was six stories tall. It had 309 rooms, uh, which were um, enabled to provide lodging for 800 people. 120 in particular was specifically for the staff that was working there. It had some amazing amenities for the time. Keep in mind the time frame that this is. This is 1836, uh, which included new gas lights, bathtubs, and toilets on each floor. Remember, it's 1836, okay? This hotel is indoor plumbing that actually works. It's a phenomenal innovation that's taking place. Pressurized water won't even be available in that area of New York until the Croton Aqueduct system is finished in 1842. So this thing is ahead of its time with the uh, the innovations that they're using to make it the place that it is. So how the heck do they pull off these things that they've got on the inside of it? Well, it had these two large cisterns in the basement that they would end up pulling from. Uh, the hotel had its own steam engine plant that could cycle all of the water through the different rooms to pressurize and run the entire system. In the basement, they also had a printing press that they used to daily print off the uh, menus for the hotel or the uh, restaurant that was inside of the hotel. Did not have a tram system, however, <laughs> which yeah. we do. Is the cake supposed to be bubbling? Uh, yes, ish. Kind of coming out from the top. top right? Oh yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. It's gonna blow and it's gonna be grand. It's gonna be. <laughs> <awesome>. <laughs> like right. Now, originally the hotel. 
Mattel had an open tree shaded courtyard within the interior of it um, where people would kind of go and just some more sheltered location uh, you know we think of today with all of the heat and everything kind of keep you cooler you couldn't hear the blasted trains things like that that they'd go to in the interior of this thing um, but in 1852 it changes they build this cast iron and glass rotunda uh, that ends up covering the courtyard and we start to see what they first called the rotunda saloon so this was this was the the tavern on site so to speak that they had specifically for the hotel a lot of hotels today on a different floors they may have a, a, a bar or you know establishment on the inside where you can get food get drinks and and this was their version of that that they originally called the rotunda saloon uh, it later becomes known as the insert the hotel's name here uh exchange and a lot of people would end up enjoying a drink and a meal there over the course of its life a number of noteworthy things would take place at the hotel for example for many years it was the headquarters of the Whig party uh, Daniel Webster, a notable Whig Party senator, would tell the Times he would stay in no other hotel. Famous Civil War photographer Matthew Brady, Brady who gives us so many of the wonderful, albeit sometimes gruesome, images that we use to study the American Civil War. We get to zoom in on things like the, you know, the expressions on people's faces, what their uniforms looked like, the equipment that they had with amber type. Uh, photography as long as it was in focus there's kind of this infinite zoom which is much different than today's modern digital stuff so even though it's antiquated it actually was a lot better in regards to that uh, he ends up staying there um, he gives us a lot of those those images he lived in the hotel in the 1840s and his studio was actually not too, too far away in 1843 another person who you may have heard of before mr. Henry Longfellow he and his wife Francis or Fanny would stay there. In fact, the hotel was a favorite place to stay on weekend trips into town by even a young Mr. Thomas Edison himself. Uh, notable events would end up occurring there as well. When the tradition in New York City began of ringing in the new year by celebrating on New Year's Eve with a countdown, the city celebrated in front of this hotel. In 1861, President-elect Lincoln from on top of the entrance portico gives an impromptu speech to a crowd of roughly 40,000 people, according to Walt Whitman, at least, in, in the things that he leaves us. And while we're speaking of presidents, there ends up being no fewer than 18 that end up staying at this hotel, um, from Andrew Jackson all the way to Dora, Mr. President Theodore Roosevelt himself, what? would stay at the hotel. Now, on November 25th of 1864, the uh, hotel was one of 13 major hotels in New York that was set on fire by Confederate spies after President Lincoln was reelected. Unfortunately, it wasn't too much damage. Thank you, good sir. We've got an episode on that too. <laughs> we literally do. Charles Tosker and, and Lisa both helped us out on that. Fortunately, when they did that, there wasn't too much damage. And also during the great blizzard of 1888, the hotel gets used as a safe haven for the people that are in that area of New York where it's located. Now, as wonderful as the hotel was, as much you know, time and thought and money was spent into it to make it the grand thing that it was, the inevitable looming marching of time and progress eventually does catch up to it. Um, by the 1870s, it was kind of considered this old fashioned place. Uh, the chief patronage at the time was mostly businessmen. And then we jump forward to 1913 and we see the beginning of the end for the hotel. The southern half of the hotel, which included the Rotenda and its famous bar, ends up being demolished due to the building of the BMT subway line, not to be confused with the BMT subway sandwich at Subway, uh, which would run through the site. The northern half would hold out for a little while longer, 1926. Uh, it ends up being demolished too for what they then called the transportation building, but today it's 225 Broadway. They were constructing that. Now, even though this hotel, which was originally called Park Hotel, was considered rather out of vogue in the later decades of the 1800s, it was still considered a pretty important fixture in New York City, despite all those things. In 1889, which is the same year that the great states of Montana and North Dakota become states in the Union, a guy by the name of J.A. Mitchell would write a short fantasy story set off in the far future, in the year 2951 to be exact, called The Last American, which... Uh, actually features the ruins of the hotel and finally reveals to us what the name, what history mostly remembers the name of this hotel. 
In the story, Persian explorers are in the ruins of New York City, and they come across stuff like the wooden god, they describe it, which was actually an old wooden cigar Indian statue. One of the old... Uh, wooden god. The wooden god. Yep, cigar store Indian statue. Uh, like what you might find in the 1880s. In the story, the explorers come across an upturned slab upon which was inscribed the name of the, the hotel. And one character says to another, the inscription is Old English. House signified dwelling, but the word aster I know not. It was probably the name of a deity, and here was his temple. So there it finally is. Wasn't wrong. No. <laughs> House Hotel was the name of this hotel in New York City. Mr. John Jacob Astor himself, owner of the hotel, creator of the American Fur Company, who in 1827 would buy out the Columbia Fur Company and employed a guy, you know, named Kenneth McKenzie. No one knows about him. And uh, Upper Missouri Outfit of the American Fur Company. And that's how it's all connected together, except for the only person who was named, Mr. Shed or Sherwood Sterling, uh, which is gonna lead us to tonight's drink. The earlier decades of the 1800s, staff and hotels could function a little bit differently, as did the libations of the time, especially considering what we're used to being able to have available to us when we go and stay at a hotel at different places. Uh, your desk clerks were the people who checked you in, they had your mail, they knew where people were, could give you information about the city we're staying in, but they're also your barkeep as well, all right? Uh, it was all the same job, so the bar was actually located right in the lobby, in a lockable cage because it's not cool when you're gone and all the patrons run off with the booze so you got to be able to, to lock it up um, for quite some time alcoholic punches were actually the mainstay that guests could come and enjoy while they were there um, however here in america unlike england uh, at that time these clerk barkeepers were starting to starting to futz with things as people do as time goes on and they learned from things that they'd heard about as well, along with their own tinkering with things. And they're, they're kind of becoming our early mixologists, right? That's leading us into mixed drinks and things like that. In and in as far as drinks and cocktails go. And that's partially how these new drinks would spread and gain popularity. For example, the mint julep, which is not tonight's beverage. Uh, that's actually how it gets spread. Okay, a guy who's working as a clerk in a hotel goes and visits another one where this guy's like, hey, I made this thing. And he's like, great, I'm gonna rip that off and do it in my hotel. And that's how the mint julep ends up being spread around in all of its popularity. Um, that one was used with ice though. It's one of the first ones that starts being used ice. Tonight is actually served at room temperature, which is hopefully not as warm as the outside ambient temperature tonight for us. Um, it's also unlikely that at, uh, or it's, likely functioned at Astor House the same way. Uh, the bar was likely a cage in the lobby until the Rotunda Saloon, which was later called the Astor House Exchange, gets built in 1852 and probably moved into that Rotunda area at that time. It had a large central mahogany bar. It had private dining rooms on the sides and two long curved counters where you could grab lunch. And this would be a favorite meeting place for New York movers and shakers for quite some time, for decades. These folks are going there specifically to stop at the Astor House Exchange. As time moved on, these mixed drinks become more and more fancy. And in the 1870s and 1880s, a number of patrons began requesting some of the, quote, old fashioned and simpler cocktails that were used from decades past. It's featured in the Mad Men series, that debauchery. Um, apologize, I don't apologize if you like it. It's a crappy cocktail. It's a crappy cocktail, okay? Um, but it likely was one that laid the framework for which it eventually became the old fashioned cocktail that unfortunately takes place during that time frame. If you're staying at the Astor House Hotel, this is actually something that you could likely request Shed Sterling to make for you. Um, as for Shed, he was one of these uh, barkeeps that's working as the, the clerk and the barkeep um, that works at the Astor House Hotel. And while we unfortunately don't know much about him, we know that he was at least a prominent enough person that was known about that history at least knows him. He's at least recorded in the annals of history as one of these clerk barkeeps that's working at the Astor House Hotel. So that brings us into tonight's beverage. Uh, thanks to David Runvrich and his book, Imbibe, uh, he's preserved for us a cocktail that he calls the original cocktail. And this comes from J.E. Alexander's Transatlantic Sketches in 1833, during the time that Fort Union's operating. And it reads as thus. For the receipt book, let the following be copied. 
Cocktail is composed of water with the addition of rum, gin, or brandy, as one chooses, a third of the spirit to two thirds of the water. Add bitters and enrich with sugar and nutmeg. Then it says NB. I still have no idea what that stands for. Moving on. If there's no nutmeg convenient, a scrape or two of the muddler, which is the wooden sugar breaker, will answer the purpose. Now, at this time of rum gin and brandy, Holland gin and brandy were two of the more popular ones in, in 1833 anyway. Um, he suggests for us to change it just a little bit with the, the starting um, model. He's suggesting two ounces of spirit, three ounces of water, uh, using one sugar cube or half an ounce, uh, preferably of Demerara sugar or Turbinado sugar. But if you've got white sugar table, table sugar, you can use that as well. Soak the sugar cube with Angostura bitters. That gets invented in 1824. So this would have been a popular one of the bitters at the time frame. And then you're going to grate nutmeg and sprinkle to taste. Now, the thing, as guys like Dave Wondrich, who's an amazing guy that looks at mixology, he points out during your time frame, you know, we can't just go and like Jamaican rum would have been the popular one at the time, one of the popular ones at the time frame. Appleton Estate is always my choice. Check out Appleton Estate, not a sponsor. Um, now, but the way that it was made then and the way that we enjoy it now are not one and the same. The proofing is much higher, right? Uh, Fort Union inventories talk about bringing in uh, high strength alcohol. How high? No freaking clue. It probably starts on fire, but they're using that and cutting it down to be part of the liquor trade that's using three ounces of water with 40 proof spirit might actually be a little bit overkill because it's already down at that 40% already. Um, if you're familiar uh, at all with uh, Demerara, Jamaican Demerara um, rum, uh, they're one of the, the last ones that's holding out uh, is, uh, oh shucks, Lemon Heart 151. It's 151 proof dark Demerara Jamaican rum. You don't want to sip on that. <laughs> you want to mix that in other things. You, you can use that to set things on fire. Um, stuff like that would have been a little bit closer to what we have today, but Jamaican rum would have been a very common thing as well, too. So it's 1833, but we're going to go back even farther because you could have enjoyed this cocktail at Fort Union by one of its predecessors. All right. Now, as we're going through that and we look at things to research them and see, is this even possible? Thank you, Rod, by the way, if you didn't know. One of the things that Rod does in his spare time, because that's the kind of guy he is, he goes through microfilm and he transcribes it so that we can study from it and learn it. And one of the things that Rod did back in 2015 or so, 2015, 2016, Rod uh, transcribes the 1831 invoice to be delivered at 1832 to Fort Union. So thank you, Rod, that, that made this research a lot better. We take a look at that list. Okay, bitters, would they have it around? Well, they were, they were called stomach bitters and they would use it as a, for medicinal purposes. And we see on the list that they've got two quarts of Stoughton's bitters that are delivered here. But not just that, they also say some material to prepare bitters, um, such as Vencian aloe, lemon peel, etc., and etc. Those are some of the same components that is in Stoughton's um, bitters. Now, like Cedric and I will talk about with historic music, the farther back you go, copyright infringement's not a thing. If you like a song, you rip it off, you put your own lyrics on it, and you, you keep on going. And people would rip off <laughs> these bitters, these Stoughton bitters, and they would, they would try to make clones of it. So all these other different outfits would make Stoughton's bitters, and on the bottom of their label, they would say stuff like, you know, um, genuine only if signed by our whatever person who and there was a spot for the mixologist to write their name on the bottom type of a thing. So uh, if this might be coming directly from England, it might not. This actually predates Angostura bitters. Uh, this starts being made in 18, no, 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 sorry. 1712 is when Stoughton bitters, that's how far back it goes. And it's being delivered here in Fort Union. Um, other stuff that's on there, nutmeg. They have delivered one pound of nutmeg, okay? Just to give you an idea, this is seven ounces of nutmeg. Wow. Seven ounces of whole nutmegs. If you've never seen what they look like, they look like this. It looks like something that you go to the church Christmas party and it's inside those bags that's got the peanuts and that awful candy. 
that's in there. That's, that's what it looks like, okay? We have that on site. We take a look at some of the other things that was listed in the, uh, the recipe. If we look at just the alcohol, for example, under a section labeled provisions and stores, we see 30 barrels strongest alcohol. Now the guys probably aren't using this necessarily. Uh, this is probably what's being used to be cut down for part of the liquor trade. Rod, please correct me at any point if you think I'm wrong because I want everyone to have the correct information on that. We see five barrels of old Monagahala whiskey. This is coming out of Scotland and it's being made by Finns. I made that up. Don't buy that. That's absolute crap. I have no idea what it is. There is one barrel of brandy. There's one barrel of Jamaican rum. There's two barrels of you know, New Orleans. New Orleans rum. New Orleans rum. <laughs> There's four barrels of shrub. There's a quarter cask of rich port wine. 15 gallons of London particular Madeira. 3,000 pounds of Havana sugar and 100 pounds of loaf sugar. So they had literally everything at their disposal to make this cocktail. So the cocktail that we described comes from 1833. They're using Angostura bitters. However, there's a cocktail even older than that, that the first mention of it we see kicks up in 1803. It also gets called the original cocktail. The main difference being Angostura bitters hasn't been made yet but Stoughton Bitters is. Everything to make that original cocktail from 1803 is on the Fort Union inventories. Could have been enjoyed by McKenzie, could have been enjoyed by the clerks, could have been enjoyed by those higher level employees working here at Fort Union in the year 1832 after the arrival of the steamboat. Or, as we get to celebrate today, the timing of the arrival of the steamboat is actually basically when our annual gathering of the rendezvous here is here at Fort Union. So we're gonna enjoy a potential Fort Union cocktail, original Fort Union cocktail, I'm gonna call it because we're here at Fort Union, that's been around since 1803, stuff straight off the inventories that they could have enjoyed. Now to start by making this, what we're gonna need is our two ounces of spirit. The jiggers of the time frame didn't look too differently than this. Um, a lot of them don't now, an outfit called Barfly makes these. If we remove this middle section, just squat it down. That's that's more of what the a lot of the original jiggers of the time frame looked like. So it's while it's been updated over time, it it still has its roots from some of those original ones. So we'll start with our two ounces of spirit. I'm using Jamaican rum, Appleton Estate, good sound since a long time, 1749. Okay, good viable option. I'm gonna top in my two ounces of the spirit. I did that out of order compared to what I wanted to and even tried to make myself remember that. But we'll keep on going anyway. Now to that, in the original recipe, they're adding three ounces of water to it. We're not gonna do that tonight unless you've got 151 proof uh, Jamaican rum, which I don't think anybody does because that's dangerous and it's flammable. I don't care, drink it if you want to. Just don't go cross-eyed and stuff. So David Wondrich suggests going with an ounce and a half. So that's what we're gonna start at as a starting point. So you can tweak this to your liking as time goes on. Then, it's supposed to be an ounce of sugar. We're gonna use sugar cubes, which are about there. These are Demerara ones. And Stoughton bitters are being manufactured in Australia. It's the only place that I can find that makes them, right? It's like 17 bucks, okay. To get them here, it's like 58. There was no way I was gonna get them from Australia to the United States. And I was like, well, crap, okay? David Wendersch does give us a recipe to be able to make Stoughton bitters. And the more and more I searched and searched, someone else made life a lot easier and goes, here's the deal, guys. We take a look at the primary ingredients. We take a look at what's available, okay? Angostura bitters, the ones that we have even still today, the primary ingredients that are in that were in Stoughton bitters. Your missing components are contained within Angostura's orange bitters. Now, there are a couple additional other things. They're more in the background. You likely won't notice them as much. And if you do a two to one ratio, you can do a type of reproduction because remember, people were ripping this off. They were making their own clones of Stoughton bitters. You can make your own Stoughton bitters. So that's, that's what I've done which hopefully is similar to what they had here in the stores in 1832 here at Fort Union. So we're gonna do some dashes of the Stoughton's bitters onto our sugar cube. That's gonna go in. 
We're gonna muddle it up. Mix it around, try to get as much of that sugar dissolved as possible. As time goes on, these type of cocktails sometimes get referred to as spoon cocktails because they'd be served with a small spoon that you could keep on stirring to keep on uh, diluting that sugar. And then the last thing, we're grating the nutmeg. They talked about uh, doing a couple grates off the muddler. He was being funny, that's a stupid idea. Don't, don't grate off the end of your muddler, it's a bad idea. And then we're gonna grate a little nutmeg to what you figure taste is for you. Angel's cut. Exciting. So here we have 1803, looking at the Port Union inventories, looking at the recipe, a drink that could have been enjoyed here at Port Union beginning in the year 1832 for sure. The original cocktail.